partnership project, project led by the Prince William Sound Science Center. Our partners include the UAF Alaska Sea Grant Extension Office, the Cordova Chapter of the Prince William Sound Audubon Society, and the U.S. Forest Service, who offers their space and equipment. Uh, my name is Meadow. I work for the Science Center. I run the lecture series and do other educational programming. So if you have ideas for future lecture topics or lecturers, let me know. Um, next week we're going to have our own Anne Schaefer, who will be talking about winter seabirds in Prince William Sound. I think she's going to touch on the die-off a little bit. Um, and so without further ado, Dan Olson is going to tell us all about killer whales. Very excited. I see a lot of familiar faces here and a lot of other folks I don't know. I haven't had a chance to spend a lot of time in Cordova except when Craig and Eve and I have gotten stormed out and had to pull in to hide from Hinterbrook entrance and what it looks like when it's blowing 40 out there. My name is Dan. I've been working with Craig Matkin and Eva Salidas for quite a long time and many of you know them quite well. And I am also working on my master's degree at UA Fairbanks, but at the Juneau Fisheries Campus. So I'm doing a project with Craig's data looking at satellite telemetry, where the killer whales are spending most of their time in the sound at different seasons and which ponds are, are using which areas. My background for how I got interested, I, I've been running tour boats as a captain in Seward for probably 13 years and just became more and more fascinated as you do with th the things around you. I bought a hydrophone and started listening, and acoustics are my passion. You're going to hear a lot more recordings like you did already. But there was one kind of formative event when there was one long killer whale off Thumb Cove in Seward, and as tour boats were going checking it out, I dropped the hydrophone, started listening, and I kept hearing these long wailing calls, these and there's all this boat noise, and it was a terrible recording, but Craig and me were coming in on the Natoa, back from the sound. I played it over the VHF and and Eva immediately, because she had done her masters on the AT1 two gas transients, she immediately said, Oh, that's one of the AT1s trying to get in touch with the rest of its group. And it had been slapping its tail and breaching and and I departed and a mile and a half later I ran into two more and then when Craig and Eva came they photographed them all and sure enough it was AT9, 10 and 18, three of the two gas transients or AT1s. And I was totally blown away that you could identify pods by their calls, by their sounds, and so I got obsessed for a while. I went down to Vancouver, BC to study the dialects of our Alaskan killer whales by a guy who'd done his PhD by coming up here working with Greg and Eva. I started to learn enough that I could drop a hydrophone and listen to a cacophony when there's 60, 80 whales around and be like, oh, the AK-16s are here, oh, the AKs are here, and just by all these calls that are coming in. It's for any of you who, anyone had the chance to listen to them live off the boat, off a hydrophone, they, they, you, you, you know, you, off the, um, but the recordings you hear today, they're just running around shouting their names out, and um, they, they have certain calls that belong to each family. So I'm going to talk a little bit about killer whales around the world, and then killer whales here in Prince William Sound, and a little bit about the differences that we see in some of the exciting new research that's going on. And some of you are very familiar with this already, I know. And, and uh, hopefully have something new or at least interesting to share with you. And I really like this quote, so I just had to start off with it. <laughs> Obviously, our culture has changed a lot in how we view killer whales. You can imagine when early peoples in the area saw them tearing apart a humpback whale, for example, they, it's easy to get the name killer whale. You can, you can imagine that people who saw these crazy events just saw some of the bloody gore on the surface without much else. And of course now, in part because we've had them in captivity, but in part mainly because studies like Craig and Eva's where we've seen 30 years of research, we now know a lot more about their social behavior, their interactions and things. And I've thrown up all these names because they're all of these names. You know, there's a big debate in our culture, our own culture and society now, whether we should call these animals orcas or killers or whales or dolphins. And, you know, if, if there are people who don't want to call them killer whales, I know some salmon who would beg to differ. <laughs> <laughs> but orca is really a, comes from a part of the Latin name, which is Orsinus orca. Killer whale is still the proper common name, so if you are to read a scientific paper, it's going to say killer whale every time. So if you hear me referring to killer whale, I, that's because I'm used to reading all the scientific papers all the time. 
obviously we have a lot of different names for them depending on your culture. And does anyone speak uh, Chugach and can pronounce that one for me? <laughs> does anyone in the room know Chugach? Okay, so there, there we there we have it. But there's kind of a big debate amongst people whether we call them orcas or killers or or whales or dolphins. The problem with whales is not a scientific term at all. All whale all whales, all porpoise and dolphins are all cetaceans. So I just kind of maintain porpoise and dolphins are whales. Whale is not a proper term, it's not definable, it's a kind of a vague approximation of size. So when so if somebody carries a banner for you Killer whales aren't whales, they're dolphins. Well, they are whales, they're cetaceans. And um, beluga, beluga is a whale, narwhal is a whale, so it just depends on where you want to define it, and that's a circular loop. The main crux of the program, uh, for many of you are familiar with the Natoa and Craig, and even what we do up there, sometimes you look out and you're like, those guys do anything other than take pictures of whales all the time? And the reality is, kind of, yes, we, we do other things, but that's a big, big piece of what we do, and I, I'll try and walk you through why it's so important. But if we can photograph every individual every year, then we end up knowing the exact ages, and we can look at trends, population trends, growth rates, all kinds of things. So we try to photograph, the goal is to photograph every individual in the population every year so we can say yes or no, they're alive that year. And as you can see, there's a lot of variation. Not only some whales have notches in their dorsal presumably from play fighting with each other. We don't think it's true aggression, but sometimes the line between true aggression and play fighting is not always clear, especially amongst teenage males and other in our society and others. But you can see scratches. These are from their own teeth, parallel scratch marks in the saddle patches. Some of these, you notice some of the saddle patches have like a a white striped little finger or thumb. Some have an open saddle is what we call that. But so there's very variation in the pigmentation and the scratches and then everything. So we are able to identify individuals. And Mike Biggs down in British Columbia started noticing that the same individuals kept swimming together and they noticed that they actually had groups. And then eventually through years of study, we found out that those groups were family groups. And in fact, that the males never never departed to swim with another pod. This male here will swim with his mother his entire life. If there's ever a definition of a giant mama's boy, <laughs> when you see the killer whales out in the sound, even the, even the transients, the big mammal-eating ones, are very likely swimming with their mother. Sometimes you see solo ones, either their mother has died or, the, or with transients a little more loose, but with resident or fish eaters, they will swim with their mothers their entire life. What that's enabled us to do is then catalog all the individuals, and many of you are familiar with this already. But if we can photograph, and I got I got photographs in 2012 of this individual and this individual in April of April 2012 off Rugged Island in Seward, and the grandma, she was a new grandma that year, so she had a calf of her own and and had a grandchild in the same year. And if you're a mother in this society. Once you become a grandmother, you're not off the hook. We see grandmothers giving birth on occasion. It's not terribly uncommon. Not only is that one of your realities, but your pregnancies last 15 to 18 months. And your adult children live in your house for whole life, so. Who would like to be a little girl mom? <laughs> so if we can keep track of these these juveniles and photograph them the next year, then we know exact their exact age, the first year that we're photographed. If we see a mother, like this mother, we saw her for many years with no calf, and then all of a sudden we see her with a calf that year. And what happens is they swim right next to their mothers when they're resting, but even for the first couple of years, they swim right next to their mothers all the time. So in their first couple of years, it's critical for us to get those, those mother-calf shots. And if you are contributing photos to us at wellsalaska gmail.com, um, then, in particular, you know, we try not to encourage people to get closer to the animals, but yet to leave a respectful distance, of course. But if you do have photos, then those mother and calf pairs are, can be really helpful because then that helps us figure out who belongs to who. If we, if we have five photographs of a calf, then three or four of those photographs will be right next to another whale, and that will be its mom. It won't be every single time, but, but if we have enough photographs, we can, we can tell that. And another bonus of this photo identification is it allows us to document some changes. And of course, 
two pods swam through the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and we saw precipitous declines in both of those pods I mean, in the years immediately following the Exxon spill. The AV pod, which are fish eating or resident killer whales, and the AT1 transients or two guys transients, which are mammal eating groups, they, both of those groups swam direct, were observed swimming directly through the spill, and they both declined quite rapidly. The AB pod is now showing a steady increase but they haven't recovered to where they were yet, and they're not on a growth rate the same as the rest of the residents in the area. The rest of the residents are doing quite well, probably because salmon has been managed better than it was in the 50s and 60s, and they also, also with the hatchery enhancement and everything, it's a more stable environment. So our residents have been doing well in general. AB pod not quite as well as the other residents. And, but then the AT1 group has not had a cap since since uh, before the oil spill. What's really fascinating in recent research is that we started recognizing different types of killer whales around the world. I know Hamish and his family's had a chance to see some of these over on the right hand side in Antarctica. I've, I've been lucky enough to see some of them down there. All the ones in the North Pacific kind of look the same. There's all those size and differences down in the southern ocean, we actually see some morphological and, and coloration changes, pigment changes. And if you hone in on the eye patch in particular, these Antarctic type A's look a lot like bar killer whales up here. Large type B's have a huge eye patch. Small type B's kind of fade off and back. Type C's are slanted on almost a 45 degree diagonal, and type B's have a tiny, tiny eye patch. And so there's quite a bit of difference in how they look. For ours in the North Pacific, in the Northern Hemisphere, not so much, but for all of these, there's been a lot of genetic study, and, and there's an incredible, incredible difference between all these different types, and we'll get into that in another slide just a little later. But one example of that is that the biggest killer whale are transients, the ones that hunt for seals and sea lions and whales and porpoise up here in Prince William Sound, are more related to these type D's than any others on the screen. And all of the others are more related to each other than, than they are to the transients. So basically, our residents here are more related to these Antarctic ones than they are to our transients. Our transients are way out in left field genetically, and the type D's are way out there with them. The offshores, who actually eat shark and other fishes, are quite close to our residents. So they think that they occurred from the original counting event. Yeah? Is um, that a camera error, or are some of the ones on the right um, have slightly different coloration? Yeah, that's an excellent question. These are actually drawings. They're just so good that they kind of look like photographs. There's an artist by the name of Uko Gorder who did all of these drawings. What, what he was trying to do there, that's actually something that happens where they get diatom staining down the Antarctic. The water's so cold that they think that they don't, that they shunt their blood and don't have as much blood flow to the, the skin, and therefore the skin does not regenerate as fast. So any growth is allowed to stay on longer. So they end up kind of orange and greenish, like diatom staining. And what's interesting is uh, Bob Pittman and John Durbin with NOAA are down in Antarctica and have some photographs of the same individual looking yellowish like that. And then the same individual, either later or before, looking quite clean and white and black and gray. And they had some satellite tags on some of those animals that went from the Antarctic to off the coast of Brazil and back to the Antarctic, all during their productive southern summer season. So not a migration that would have made sense for giving birth to calves, not a migration that would have made sense for feeding. They really absolutely think it's a spa run. <laughs> <laughs> they do the slough skin. So it's really fascinating that these satellite tags just trucked it. It was it was something like ten thousand kilometers round trip in forty days or something. It was ridiculous. Too fast too fast for brand new calves to catch up. So they, they think they just really bolted to warm water so they could flush that blood to the skin and regenerate skin and run back down while the while the productivity was still good in Antarctic to feed and bulk up again and not have that trip cost them too much. Because they have so much food in Antarctic in the summertime, they can just fatten up, 
make that trip, come back, still fatten up, and get through their long lean winter, which is pretty fascinating. And I recommend you look up that paper if you're interested. That was in 2010. And they, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. But that's a good observation. So one thing interesting in the southern hemisphere, you know, you probably are vaguely familiar already with how not only we have genetic differences, but we have social differences and and diet differences. Residents, as I've mentioned, as you probably already know, eat fish only, never been observed eating mammals. The transients or big killer whales eat mammals, but have never been seen eating fish. And they're very loyal to those habits. Offshore killer whales have been observed eating Pacific sleeper sharks, which can grow to 20 feet. Um, I've actually pulled a four foot litter out of the water in Resurrection Bay from a sleeper shark that offshore has taken. They also may eat, they also eat some other fish, but they appear to target shark. And then in the North Atlantic, the type ones um, have been seen eating fish. The type twos have been seen eating mammals. And you notice the size difference that, that, that comes with that. In the Atlantic, it's not so certain that they don't cross over, that the mammal eaters don't eat a few fish, or the fish eaters don't eat a few mammals. But here in the North Pacific, in Alaska, we have 30 years of study. In British Columbia, they have 30 years of study. And in the San Juan Islands, they have 30 years of study. And all of it agrees that they've never, we've never observed transients eating fish or residents eating mammals, which is pretty fascinating. In fact, one time they captured a transient not knowing the difference. They had it in a pen. They were trying to feed it fish because they didn't know the difference of the time. The transit wouldn't didn't touch any any of the fish they were giving it for three weeks or something. And then finally, they had it in a net pen next to another net pen with a resident fish eating kill whale. And the resident, the fish eating kill whale, pushed half of the fish through the net to the other one, and it finally took it and ate it. But they just don't see this food. It's just it's. Kind of like if we look at a field of grass, we're not going to eat it, and a cow might, but it's just, it's, it's almost that different. It's hard for some of us to think, why wouldn't they just eat fish if there's, if there's fish around, those transients, but it's pretty locked in solid. In the Antarctic, we don't know how exclusive those diet things are. Type A's in the Antarctic have been seen attacking whales, but we don't know if that's all they eat. The large type B's are the ones that wave wash seals on off the ice in the Antarctic, if you've seen videos of that, and if you haven't seen the videos of that, go home tonight, You look up YouTube and look up Antarctic uh, killer whales wave washing seals, and then four or five of them line up and wash the wave over the thing. And the small type bees have been seen eating penguins, but not seals, but they might, but we, we don't really know, and there is a size difference, so it's, it's likely that they have a strong habit there. The type C or Rossi killer whales have been observed eating fish, Patagonian toothfish and Antarctic cod. I think there's a few fish that they've been seen eating in the Ross Sea, but they have not been seen eating males. And the type D in the Southern Ocean have been following around some long liners down in the Southern Ocean. So we think they eat fish, but we don't really know. There's very little known about type D. So very strong differences here. Yeah? The females are smaller than males. Typically, that's the case. Females tend to be smaller than males for most of these types. Yeah. So you, you have, I didn't explain that. We have females on the right and males on the left for each of these types. <coughs> um, um, some most whales have females larger than males. Well, humpbacks, for example, the females are larger than the males. But for, I think for most of the toothed whales, the males are larger. And I don't know across the board how the baleen whales stack up. I know that humpbacks are, the females are larger, but can't recall all of the species off the top of my head. But yeah. Two questions. Uh, which ones of the southern hemisphere killer whales have been observed uh, beaching themselves for food? <clears throat> um, I don't think they have genetics on those, and I don't think there are any of these types. That's more temperate or more tropical waters in Argentina. Right. And, and in the tropics, see, most all of these types of killer whales are in high latitudes, high productivity areas. And in the tropics, it's it's not really known, but it's generally believed that they may eat mammals and fish a bit more in the tropics because there's just not the abundance to specialize. It's kind of like you go to a big city and a carpenter's a carpenter and makes such good money being a carpenter. Of course, he's not going to be an accountant, but here in Cordova, you got to be an accountant and a carpenter and a fisherman <laughs> to make ends meet through the... So it's, I think the deal seems to be where there's high abundance 
there's high specialization in the tropics. Um, so there are many other types, other genetic haplotypes in the world than these types, but these are some that have been classified in neater packages than in the tropics. They haven't, they haven't been able to classify that. I don't know if they have any genetic samples off those ones in Argentina or not. They've been pretty well studied visually from the beach, but in terms of, I'm not sure if they've taken genetics, and I don't think they would fit into these. And if, and I don't even actually have a guess on which they'd be most related to. I might actually have a slide that might address that, but it, in the fine print. Second, second question, real quick. I apologize. Are offshore considered more transient or resident? They're more genetically related to residents, and they do eat some fish. They are, but they have a huge range. The terms resident and transients you should really just throw in the waste bin because it's really misleading. Residents were called residents because they kept going to the same fishing holes. It's kind of like if you went to, if you like to go fishing in Cordova in June, but Kodiak in September, and you know you still might have a really long range, but you have your patterns, and that's what they noticed. That's why they called them residents to begin with. So. You kind of want to throw those names out. We started by trying to honor Michael Biggs by calling the transients Biggs, Biggs Killer Whales, and hopefully we'll come up with a new name for uh, the residents eventually, and, and because those names really do mislead quite a bit. But residents and offshores are very closely related. Down in the Antarctic, I'll just take you through this real quick. Here's those type A's attacking the minke whale on the very top row. And this is from uh, Bob Pittman's paper, oh, 2003. Well, this paper's 2003, the spot run paper later. The type Bs, those are the ones wave washing the seals off the ice. And can you imagine what that seal feels like? <laughs> and then the type Cs down low uh, in, the, in the Antarctic. And I took this screenshot off a video, and it's pretty poor, but you get the idea. There's five killer whales lined up, swimming at high speed towards the ice, all diving at precisely the same time, making a wave, and that wave washed over the ice and washed the seal. I don't know if it washed it in that instance all the way off, but almost all the way off to the other side of the ice. Ice well, and sometimes that wave breaks up the ice in smaller chunks and makes it easier for them to go to. I highly recommend you looking at that if you haven't already. So here's the highly technical 2015 genetic paper from from Phil Marin and, and Andrew Foote. And to get back to your, your question about the tropics, I don't think the prints. There's some small letters in here. ENP is Eastern North Pacific. And some in here, there's some TPs, tra Eastern Tropical Pacific and Western Tropical Pacific. So there's this list is all the different haplotypes. The other slide tried, tried to combine them into the the neat ecotypes that had distinguished behavior types and social networks. But really, there's lots of different haplotypes around the world. These are just the clusters that, that tend to work well. And to answer your question, I'm going to guess that the ones in Argentina, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hazard a guess that they're clustered in either the, the Atlantics I'm going to guess that they're in here, but I'm not, I'm not certain of that. There's, they've noticed from the genetic flow, they've noticed a few founding events where they can tell that these killer whales in this part of the world probably came from this other part of the world because of the way the genetic relatedness. So what's haplotype mean? Uh, genetic haplotype is just a, when you run out the DNA, it's, it's yeah. DNA strings that are like other DNA strings of similar animals. So. So it, it just gives you a general degree of, of relatedness. Now, a lot of people were using mitochondrial haplotypes for a long time. And now, because genetics are getting so much faster and less expensive, we're able to go into the whole nuclear genome, which is really complicated, too. So mitochondrial will be a mother and her offspring, and just the matril matriline lineage down through time, so you can see who's mother to who on down through many generations, then the nuclear DNA will show you inflow from males into that matrilineal lineage. If that makes some sense or if that's helpful. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, the offshore ones are extremely tiny. There's only one tiny line at the very top that has offshore in it. Yep, which is a good observation. That means they're they haven't been separated very long from other types. 
and that means they are very closely related to the residents. So it probably wasn't very long ago that the offshores split off from that. And what likely happened in that scenario, and this is just a guess, but it's a pretty well-founded guess on how a lot of these are suspected to have happened, is that you had some residents, some fish eaters, and they're all eating fish. And then, you know, sometimes some of us like to do something a little different now and then, but for the most part, humans and animals will do what your parents teach you because that works. It's a known thing, and it works, and you keep going with it. And a lot of people stay in their same homes. And Alaskans are a little different. We're a little different, but... For the most part, any given animal species does well to do what it's learned from its parents and just keep going. And then occasionally you get one that goes off and tries something. And I bet there was some resident fish eating killer whales at one point in time that tried eating some shark and realized that there was this huge untapped resource. And maybe it wasn't as tasty to all the rest, but they, they started doing it and got in rhythm. And then they got, maybe they got better at diving than the other ones did. Or maybe they just got an instinct for it. And whatever happened, it was working for them for a while. And there's not many offshore killer whales in the world, ones that we've observed, including in on sharks in the Pacific. There's some in New Zealand that eat shark, but they're not related necessarily. But So it's, it's likely that we're seeing the beginning of the offshore split or the tail end because something's not working. Maybe it's, maybe it's not good for them to eat shark because their teeth do get worn down. The skin wears down their teeth. So we have seen offshore whales washed up on the beach out in western Alaska probably died because of tooth infection. We've seen, we've seen that in stranded animals where where killer whales that eat shark have worn down their teeth. Yeah. The other thing that can make me think about perhaps the offshores would be an interesting way to maybe identify them. A shark is very high in iodine and <coughs> mm -hmm. some creatures can't tolerate that. Right. So you, I wonder if there's like some sort of physical signature that's shown in the resistance to iodine or Right, that would be interesting, yeah. Yeah, and eventually if they adapt well enough, you know, and any given animal is, you know, obviously we have animals that that are highly adapted to deal with certain contaminants or certain, or cow-eating grass can deal with the, you know, that type of thing. Well, maybe it's given long enough, if they're successful for long enough, then then they'll be able to, then they'll be able to deal with some of that. And I return to this slide just because this is just the northern hemisphere ones, and I want to move on from what we're talking about, the worldwide types, to just focusing in on Prince William Sound. So I won't even talk about the North, the Atlantic ones anymore, but just the three on the top, residents, transients, and offshores, or residents, bigs, and offshores. And when we see large groups out in the Sound, usually it's residents. It's very rare that offshores come in the sound. They do, but they travel in huge groups, 80, 60, 80, 100 individuals. We have seen residents in groups. You, if you see 100 individuals, you're more likely seeing residents than offshores. But when offshores do show up, there might be like three over there, two there, one there, three there, two there, one there, three there, one, for as far as you can see. And those are the, those are the shark eaters. They're, both offshores and residents are very vocal, like vocalizing a lot of the time. They both travel in large groups. And we don't know much about the family structure of offshores because they're very poorly studied. For residents, we know very well that they're going to swim with their mothers their entire life and have very stable social structures, especially in a group of that size. If you have a pod of 40 residents, sometimes you might see this 20 or that 20, not always all together, but on a very basic level of a grandmother and her daughters and their offspring, you'll see them together all the time very consistently without splitting or moving off. And the only time a mating happens, see this male is swimming with his siblings and, and, and cousins all the time, he doesn't mate within the family, but rather when you get large superpods, I'll mention that in a minute, where the males cross over and that's more of a temporary, temporary deal. The transients you tend to see in smaller groups, and they still often swim with their mothers, but it's such a small group that it may not be like cousins and things like that, but just uh, they're smaller groups, they're quiet, obviously very genetically distinct is what we talked about earlier, and, and their behavior is quite different too. And for those of you who have seen transient killer whales, they kind of slink around real quietly, it's very easy to lose them. You might see them for a little bit, and then they're gone, you don't know where they went. Whereas the residents are pretty conspicuous and you usually keep on seeing them for quite a bit of time. <clears throat> so here's a good example of a resident pod. These, these are the AD11s. The A stands for Alaska. 
and I've made up this whole board. It might be too dark to see, but in the whole world, here's what I talked about before, resonance, transients, offshores, Antarctic, A, B, C, D, and the Atlantic types. And amongst resonance and transients, we have a naming system here in Alaska. They basically went through the alphabet in British Columbia and Washington State. So Craig went through the alphabet again, you putting an A on the front for Alaska. So, so if you have J, K, and L pod down in the San Juan Islands, we have an A, J pod, an A, K pod, A, L pod. They're not related. It's just, it's just a naming scheme we use. So we have all these pods. And this pod here is the A, D, 11 pod, named after A, D, 11 herself, who was a grandmother. And through the photo identification, we can tell who belongs to who and what their exact ages are and that sort of thing. And Craig just put out a population dynamics paper. We often see mothers giving birth at the age of about 13 years old for the first time. And they, so they gain sexual maturity at 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. The males have a small dorsal fin until they're about 10, 11, 12 years old, and then it starts growing. So you can't tell if a small juvenile is a male or female until that fin starts growing. So about the age of 12 or 13, you're like, oh, I bet that one's a male. Sure enough, ne over the next couple of years, by the time it's 18 or 20 years old, it will have a five and a half foot dorsal fin somewhere in here. And so some of these life history parameters we can determine through a long range study like this. And then over time, if some of those, if some of those parameters change, like if, if mothers start giving birth to calves later in life, then you know that it's, that it's not as productive of an ecosystem for them. You know, if, if, if things are good, they're probably going to give birth at a younger age than if things are not so good for them. And the calving interval, we see them giving birth to calves every three years or so. And if, if, um, if, if production's down for fish, then we might see that one the out. If it speeds up, we can see a short now. So that's part of the part of the goal and some of what we do, but just in over general, general population trends we like to look at as well. For these, I wanted to um, mention just a little bit about culture. You have, I don't know if you've ever um, read studies about you know elephants and many of the apes and bonobos and chimpanzees and things exhibiting culture. Dolphins that use sponges as tools to not um, anyone ever heard of the dolphin, sponge using dolphins for them? They'll use sponges to help them forage and so they don't scrape up their, their beak, their rostrum on the, on the substrate on the floor. There's skills that get passed down through generations basically, that's part of the definition of culture. And so amongst killer whales and chimpanzees, bonobos, elephants, you, you see things, you see elements of culture displayed and one of those is through the calls being repeated by the calves. And this is, um, you're gonna hear the mother call first and then the calf afterwards. Pretty goofy, pretty uh, short and squiggly and You'll hear that for a few months up to a, a year where the calf is trying to imitate the call, doesn't quite get it right, and then as they go to adulthood, you'll start hearing them uh, to get the calls a bit more clear. We have, you know, typically we heard, you heard the calls on the hydrophone when we first came in, you have calls coming and going, and I had the rare opportunity of coming across a pod one time Oops, I got these slides out of order. I meant to make those calls just right there, and then, there we go. So I came across this pod one time, and, and all of the individuals were there. They were resting, so it was easy to photograph all of them. They were in Resurrection Bay, but I did not see the mother, Oxo, and she's pretty obvious because she has this little notch right here. So Scana 8022 has a notch. Capra has two notches. And so it was very clear which group this was, but I could not see Oxlow in any of the photographs, any of the, and she was just flat out missing, and that's really rare. They're always generally together, especially when they're tight and resting. So I dropped a hydrophone, and this is what we're here to. never hear them calling that frequently. 
These calls are way shorter than they normally. We know these calls really well from this group. These are shorter than they usually call them, higher pitch than they usually call them, and much more frenetic. So I'm quite sure um, that it was this one. This one wasn't born yet in this recording, but it was this one. calling out for mom, but you never hear that rate of calling unless you have 80 animals in the area, and that's usually sporadic calls from, from various individuals. Usually you hear about one-tenth of that rate of, rate of calling. So it's pretty interesting to hear, hear that uh, obviously fairly distressed animal trying to figure out where mom was, and then about three hours later the mom did, mom did show up. And, and the, we dropped the hydrophone again, and it was pretty much back to normal, just sporadic occasional calls. Interesting. Have that AK pod here, and this is a pod that you're likely to see in Prince William Sound. Dave, I'm sure you've seen AKs, and folks know these animals. And I put them up here. There's two halves to the AKs, and they used to all swim together prior to about 1993, but then we saw them split up. And uh, the grandmother's now passed on, but since this is an older photo, since since then, we've now had, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, this AK-6 passed on. In the same year she passed on, then the year after a new camp was born to make this one's grandmother. So she went from losing her mom to becoming grandmother in about a year. And we see these, these animals a lot in Resurrection Bay, seen in Kodiak, seen in Prince William Sound quite a bit. We had a satellite tag on AK-1, and he spent a lot of time in late June, early July, right up between us and Gravina right here, just in these in these coves there. And there's a, let me just tell you, there's a, is there a returning chum run in there? Somewhere in late June, early, early July? Which is likely what they're, they're going for. But I wanted to play you some calls. Here's both halves of the group. They all used to swim together. And you can hear how, just how similar they are. So here's the the group up on the upper left. And do you hear that little hiccup at the very, very end of the call? Little break right at the end of the call. The other half on the lower right, they have a swoop that's much more smooth on the Exact same call, but with just a little subtle difference, a little break, a little hiccup on to the group on the top. What's what's very likely that happened is that there was a great grandmother along the line who was alive providing the same standard call for everybody and that they all had that modeling, that consistency. And then when they started swimming separately, they no longer had the constant modeling from the older sister or the grandma or whoever it was. And so there's cultural drift that we see in these killer whales that their calls slowly diverge over time. So cousins sound alike and unrelated pods sound totally different. And in fact, what we've found is that the mating happens, reproduction happens um, by least acoustically sim similar animals. We like to call that the sexy foreign accent theory <laughs> mating. So they go, for the, they go for the sexy foreign accent. And that's called a uh, super pod, when you get all kinds of different whales all together. And Prince William Sound is prime for this. It's kind of like a crossroads, a meeting ground. Yeah. When they make the super pod, is that exclusively residence then? For their uh, yes. So they don't breed between the Correct. Types. Yeah, they don't think that transients and residents have probably not interbred at all in the last 350,000 years. Is that a current estimate? Somebody was guessing it's 700,000 years a while back, but, but yeah, it's, it, it's been a long time since. Or I should say there's been very little crossover in the last 350,000 years is how they like to how they like to say it. So here's a super pod for you. And we're hearing calls from all the different kinds of pods. That last loud call from the AJs. 
That one. The squiggly is from the ABs. That is from the AKs. Oops, that's my sister. <laughs> And it's pretty remarkable to be sitting out there with a the hydrophone down and seeing just whales everywhere and just hearing this cacophony of this particular recording is in Hog Bay, um, in Pastel Rington. That's on, I don't know, is that? Is that? Hog Bay? South of Amish. Amish Pass. <laughs> yep. Uh, there's echolocation in there. They're feeding as well, so you'll hear echolocation where they're bouncing signals off. And now imagine this. We think of like, you know, Marco Polo or shouting an echo off a cliff. But keep in mind that any dolphin or any tooth whale, sperm whale, has had echolocation its whole life. And you ever hear blind people that know when people, somebody's rearranged the furniture in the room by the way the sound travels in the room. They can tell if it's an empty room or if it's a full room. And they can, how sounds absorb. So imagine animals that have specialized towards this. And if you hear a call over there, some of those calls have biphonic, or biphonic which means they might have a <laughs> with a <laughs> through it. If I'm facing away, you don't hear the high whistle, you just hear the low part. The <laughs> so if a, if a calf hears mom and they only hear the low part, they know she's facing away. If they hear both parts, you know that she's facing them. And then take the echoes off the walls and they hear all that. Then you add in echolocation, and their echolocation is so refined when they do tests with dolphins in a pool. They can tell the difference between a quarter inch and an eighth inch ball bearing at 100 meters or so. And, and they can also, they think that they know when a woman's pregnant in a pool. And their echolocation is probably refined enough that they would know, I would probably know if my friend or sibling had a fish in their belly or a fish in their mouth. There's all these... They don't have a need for language like we have. They already have this spatial awareness that's so off the hook that uh, these calls are just family identifiers. But if you just imagine the wealth of information. And you ever had a bird fly between you and the sun? So that tells you, A, that there's something in the sky. And a lot of, a lot of small rodents have a freak out thing to that. And it tells you where the sun is and it tells you where a potential predator or bird or something is. They probably have the same thing Acoustically, if you have waves washing on a gravel beach, this whoosh sound, and one of their siblings swam between them and that sound, that difference in how that sound gets arrived at them is probably, tell, they can probably tell the difference between their their huge eight-ton male uncle and their three-ton sibling. You know, it's, so they can probably uh, they can probably get a lot of information that we can't even dream of just based on that. It's a highly acoustic world that they live in. So that was all residents that we were talking about there, the fish eaters, which some of which have a very long range. And how often do they have the big super pods? Once a year, twice a year? Oh, it can happen any time during the summer. There, it's it's really hot in early <coughs> September sometime, but it, it, we can see them in July sometimes too. We saw one in May. We had a hundred animals in Hinchinbrook last May. So it's, yeah, it's really, um, <clears throat> I'm running a little later than I want to be, so I'm going to try and move along here a little bit. Our transients, our biggest killer whales are the ones that hunt mammals. This is in Hinchbrook entrance just uh, last May as well. They're quiet. They don't make the calls because they have to be quiet and stealthy. They don't echolocate. Here's the AT1s or the Chugach transients. Sometimes have bigger notches, but the males don't have as large a dorsal fins. They're less hooked. They're, they're more triangular for all of them. We don't have a time limit on this. Okay. Thing, so it's like we don't have to get out of here by eight or something. Uh, I mean, well, somebody might have to, but I'll, I'll don't still feel try like to, need to I'll rush. still try to move it along to be <laughs> respectable. <laughs> um, so we have, and this particular group is the group I mentioned swam through the oil spill. There were 22 of them in 1988. There's seven of them now, and this is a. This is the group that Eva Salidas studied for her masters, and we just lost Eva to cancer a few weeks ago. And many of the people in this room are quite close to her, and, and we, she will be missed in the work that she's done. But as she was aware of her oncoming cancer and, and watching this group of animals dwindle from 22 to 7, she, she wrote this book that Dave brought by a copy of. So you can see it. It's uh, Integrate Silence. And she wrote this over the last couple of years. 
um, and published it before passing on. So Eva is wrote this book just paralleling her own uh, feelings of mortality along with watching the animal, the family of animals that she studied for her master's degree over many years and the years afterwards. And just kind of a parallel story there. And um, is Nick Doc in here? No idea. Oh yeah? Oh yeah. You're oh you yeah. Um I forgot to talk to you today. Anyway, so Nick was out of the water this weekend and contributed some photos. I went begging and pleading to, uh, to Rachel, because she mentioned they were out this weekend. And you can see quite obviously that um, once, you, once I saw these photos, I got excited because these are the two guys transients, the ones. So you know EAC down in the tribal center, the skeleton down here in Cordova? That's AT1. It's actual ID numbers AT1, so the whole group is named after that one, um, the AT1. So here's AT2, 3, and 4. And so Nick got some photos. Here's AT2, and there's a, you can't, in these it's hard without zooming it up, but there's a teeny notch here that is right there. More obviously, AT4, the huge notch in Chiniga. And then a little notch in AT3, the male, and when you zoom in, the next photos you can see there. But there's just right here off of, right here off of Cordova. So where they, are the buildings in the background? Just coming around the Summel Point. Yeah, we saw them further out, but we kind of <coughs> followed a little bit in there, set up my shop down in the background. And these, the AT1, the two guys transients have been observed a lot eating harbor seals and dolls porpoise, but they've never been observed eating, or by Craig or Eva over many, many years, never been seen attacking sea lions have been observed harassing humpback whales, but never been observed attacking or killing humpback whales. So um, even amongst the transients that eat mammals, there still seems to be high specialization. But if you think about it, it's dangerous work taking on a mammal. Or even for the residents, it's, it may not be dangerous to take on a fish, but it's hard agility to capture a fish in the first place. So once they start down the road of specializing, you may sacrifice, these mammal eaters may have sacrificed the ability to catch a fish. Their bones are more robust when they look at the bones. If you look at the skeleton down here, you know, its, it's jaw bones are going to be more robust than in a resident fish eating kill whale because they've evolved and adapted over, over so much time. That they're, these are probably less capable of catching fish than they were 300,000 years ago. Which is kind of interesting. Anyway, thanks, Nick, for the shots. That's pretty cool. I was, I was pretty excited and I emailed Craig right away. So the AT2, 3, and 4 are still alive because now that we're down to 7, we kind of are excited to see when, when we have animals alive. And then I'll wrap up here a little bit with, with offshore killer whales. We don't know much about them, but they do arrive in huge groups. We see them like maybe once every few summers, and there's a couple summers where we might see them a couple times. They have gone all the way up into Valdez. They've gone all the way up into Resurrection Bay right by the ship lift. We've seen They've been seen in Kachemak Bay and Homer, but just not all the time. The same, one same individual was photographed in Dutch Harbor and in Los Angeles. <laughs> and so they have an enormous, enormous range. And what, maybe they need to make that range um, in order to make their food happen, or maybe they just like the warmer water. We're not sure. It's not really a migration, but they just kind of do these big feeding loops. They have been seen in southeast Alaska in the wintertime, so it's not totally a a warm and cold thing, but generally seems to be. And there's the litter I pulled out of the water in Resurrection Bay. That's from a Pacific sleeper shark. The DNA came back. And the shark experts think that came from a 12 or 13 foot shark. And the sleeper sharks can get up to 20, 20 feet. Now, people have observed killer whales in other parts of the world turning, I think they've turned great whites, but other sharks upside down. They, they know that trick, they turn them catatonic, and they have, killer whales have taken on great white sharks. We don't, the one that attacked a great white shark that was observed down in the Farallons off of California, we don't know if it was an offshore or a transient or a tropical generalist. We don't, we, have, we don't actually know. And just a couple brief slides about my project. Um, we put on satellite tags, about 35 satellite tags, a little, about as big as your thumb on animals to see where they're going. And I don't know if you can see it in this slide or not. There's just a couple little raised 
bumps on this dorsal fin that in this image you can't really see very well, but there's uh, sometimes they just leave, not really leave scars per se, but just little raised well type bumps. Um, not, I sometimes I think that the boat approach is more invasive than the actual tag, but the tags have only been staying in about a month's worth of time that eventually the tissue rejects the tags and they pop out. And like the AEs are, we joke about them, they're the home bodies of Prince William Sound. If, you, if you've worked in Prince William Sound a lot, you've seen the AEs, I'm sure. And a lot of them have a curled dorsal fin right now in the AEs, and so if you see a really curled over dorsal fin, it's probably one of the AEs, not necessarily. But not only is this tag, this was only about a month, did it stay in such a small range. We tagged one other AE and it stayed in that small range. And the only photographs we've ever gotten outside the sound I got a photograph of an AE right off of uh, Fort Bainbridge. Craig got one right off of Montague. And one of my deckhands in Seward got one right off of Cape Resurrection. Other than that, we we haven't had any. They're, they're just total homebodies. We even followed some AEs one time down Elrington Passage. And they were with the AKs, and we were joking, like, oh, what's going to happen when they get to the ocean? No, oh, one told us not to go to the ocean, you know? Like, <laughs> you know, and then, and then they. They, uh, they actually stopped. Four of the AE stopped and two were still the AKs. And then eventually those two came back and they went up in the center. So they, they do not, that family does not like the ocean. But contrast that with the AGs. So when, when people ask, people often ask you certain questions to characterize an animal. It's like, they say, what is the range of a killer whale? And you're just like, really? <laughs> Which, what do you want? Um, and when you think about residents versus transients, these are residents, these are fish eaters. So the so-called residents that have a small, little, tiny range, whatever, actually that's 1,300 kilometers. So they have an enormous range. And that's not a one-off. <coughs> the other pods that spend time in southeast, AF, the AF-22s and the AF-5s, also have made that trip several times. We, so they center their range down here and we see them frequently up here, but we think it's not food driven. We think it's social, social and sexually driven. We think that they're uh, want to get out, and get out of town and explore a little bit. But but it but it's quite it's it's quite fascinating. That kind of that kind of a difference is pretty massive. So when we're studying them, we have to kind of take it into account. If we see some behavior or something going on, are we just getting a slice of the pie? Are we getting the whole thing? Then I took all the satellite tag data from 37 tags and kind of did some scientific statistical wrangling with with a computer program to make these heat maps and it's it looks pretty simple and it does not reflect the amount of time I sat there banging my head against the computer in my desk trying to make the computer code to work and run and all that and all the hoops you have to jump through. But the interesting take homes that I saw this this is from kind of all the satellite tags that we put out together representing uh, almost a thousand days worth of, yeah, I think about a thousand days worth of data um, on these tags, is that, you know, June was really hot in Resurrection Bay and in Hinchbrook, and we've known that in the past, and a little bit up in the corner there, that's where AK1 was in, up in, uh, in Ravina. July stayed hot in Hinchinbrook, and of course the AK1 was still up along that coast up towards the Tilly. August got really spread out. September and October were super hot down in Montague. And so what we think might be going on is that June and Keene Fjords, we know that there's a good Chinook run returning then. That's hatchery enhanced. In June and July, um, this we have got, gotten chum scales there in Hinchinbrook in June and July. We've also gotten Chinook but I do know that AFK has an extreme, you know, two million, two million chum return to AFK, right, that peaks in late June. So that, we don't know if that's what's going on, but it certainly could have a piece of that puzzle. In August, you know, coho, everyone seems to report coho being everywhere. And that, that could explain the whales being spread out, but it may or may not. But that, that could be why this is so spread out, whereas other seasons are so focused. We're not sure. September and October, we're not really sure if that's chum, coho, king, but whenever we pick up scales out of the water when there's predation events, um, about 98% of any prey samples we get 
is Chinook, Chum, and Coho. Chum, probably in the order of Chinook, Coho, Chum. Um, rarely any pinks, rarely any sockeye, um, rarely anything else at all. But we can't count out that it, it might be some bottom fish as well that either don't have scales or they're getting consumed so deep that we never see the scales come up to the surface. There's other possibilities. But, but an overwhelming, not just here, but also in Washington State and British Columbia, that, that uh, Chinook and Cobo are overwhelmingly uh, a big part of the prey samples we get from the resident fish eaters. And then, of course, a little spot out by Kayak Island that seems to be pretty hot sometimes. We've heard reports that there's a lot of salmon out there. We've heard reports of a lot of forage fish out there. Is there anybody fish out there that far out? <laughs> yeah, that's Bering River. Huh? Yeah, the, the Lake Coho run in the yeah, fall? Yeah, the Lake Coho run, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard of that. Is that is that, that one right there? Yeah. I've heard of that being a pretty good run right there. So we're trying to put those pieces together and also and uh, see if we can get some more diet samples over time. But the other interesting is just the variation by pod. So these are, again, the AB pod and AJ pod are related pods to each other, fairly related. They have a share of haplotype. And you notice their patterns of use are quite similar to each other. And then they use the entrances, and they use the kayak island area, and occasionally come down to Kenan Fjords. And then, again, this is just a snapshot. It's not, it's not a really great picture of what they're doing all the time, but not going up into the fjords that much. Whereas the AD-16s and AKs, and we know they're related to each other fairly well. They're pretty pretty close cousins, and they have been observed using the, the fjords and bays going way up. So there's a bit of habitat partitioning by these different groups that's probably just what you've learned over time. Like, I learned from my mom that fishing good's here in spring, and I go there. And I learned from mom that fishing's good here in the fall, and end up going there. So that's quite interesting. Is well. And then Montague Straits, there's uh, something I'd really like to get out in the long run. Is that we have here's the, the dotted line is the 200 meter contour. So this is raw data from satellite tags on this side, and then these are our boat follows when we're with whales in the Natoa. And both of these suggest that a lot of their activities can find that 200 to 300 meter depth of water, at least in Montague Strait in particular. And a little bit in Hinchinbrook is happening the same way, but that depth seems to be very important to them. And when we look at, we had depth on a few of the tags, not many of the tags we had, but here's a depth profile of a tagged animal. So while it was in Montague Straits, here was the depth profile of the deeper dives. So these shallower dives are when they're resting or maybe social, and we assume that the deeper dives are when they're foraging. And they're going 200, 250 meters, and we know from this area that that's how deep the water is. So they're going either very close, either all the way to the bottom or very close to the bottom, and quite frequently. Now these were males. Males being bigger could conceivably dive uh, deeper and for longer. We know that females can dive that deep. We've, we've even had tags go to 550 meters. And in Antarctica and South Georgia, they've had tags going to 900 meters, uh, 980, I think. And so they're capable of diving very, very deep. They could be doing black cod and halibut and things, and, and we're, we're trying to look at that a bit more closely. Obviously, they, they do take black cod and halibut from long lines, and, and we're trying to learn more if that's part of their natural diet as well, and I'm sure it is, but just what time of year and how much is the big question. But no problem for them to dive regularly deeper. But what we do see, the difference between males and females, is that sometimes you ever see killer whales spread out over a whole channel, if you pay attention, sometimes the males are out over the deeper water and the, the females and calves are closer to the shallow water. And it could be that the females are diving less deep just because they need to return to their calf quicker or their calf can't dive as deep for as long, uh, even if the female was capable of. So there's been some papers in British Columbia talking about that gender difference and it's probably driven by having a calf in tow than it is by actual diving abilities by yourself. So that's, that's pretty interesting and unfortunately it's really challenging to observe predation events at 300 meters or else we'd have more information to give you on what exactly is going on there. Whether that's, you know, and whether that's all deep Chinook and Chum or whether that's a mix of, you know, some halibut and ling cod and black cod and maybe even peacock, you know, you know, just predation as well, there's all, there's all kinds of possibilities there. But it is highly seasonal, again, we're seeing a lot of use 
here in September, October. We're not really seeing it there in May through July. And in winter, we don't really know. But they do show up there in the winter time too, from reports. But we just don't know how, how much, how often. So those are the questions we're trying to get at. And in the future, we're going to try and put out some hydrophones so that we can see what they're doing in the winter more. And because of those dialects, the calls that we were hearing before, not only do we know if killer whales show up to a certain area with a hydrophone, we then also could know which family of killer whales show up. So if it's just a generally good for all the pods in the area, or if there's specific pods keep coming back to the same spot in winter time. Trying to get some scat collection. Um, you can find it. Uh, it's not easy. But if we can, then you can find the DNA of, of the fish that they've been eating. And so you can uh, get a little bit more clear picture of what they've been eating. And then stable isotopes and fatty acids. Don't draw a complete picture either, but they give you an idea if they're eating high in the food chain or low in the food chain. For example, we see a declining stable isotope picture through time, through the season. So we think it's from eating Chinook, which are eating higher in the food chain, to eating Coho, which are eating lower in the food chain as the season progresses. We think that's why we see this, the um, stable isotope signature declining throughout the season. And contaminants, the good news is we're seeing less contaminants um, as as we're using less PCBs in the in North America, we're we're seeing less contaminants, but um, the, those sometimes can paint a little bit of a picture for us. What's going on? And we're hoping to collaborate a little more strongly with some of the salmon sampling studies. Prince William Sound Science Center has been doing some trawls in the entrances to look for different types of salmon they're finding at different times, and collaborate with that. And I I have to. I have to just leave you a little bit of the good stuff. That's why you came here, really. I want to see the gore. And the, this is in Hinchinbrook entrance. I was out with Craig and Eva. There's a doll's porpoise being chased. Doll's porpoise being caught. Teeth marks in a doll porpoise and even a broken back. And the dinner bell was, dinner bell was ringing. These were not the AT ones, but uh, AT73 group that will sometimes come through the sound. And I'll leave you with some of Nick's nice photos from the weekend. We do accept if you have photos you think will be helpful for identifying animals, you can send them to whalesalaska at gmail.com. And that is Thanks. Yeah. It's awesome. So sorry I ran a little bit longer on what I'd like to. Well, I took a fair bit of questions in the meantime. But, yeah. Can you see the dolls and the residents? Yeah. Dolls porpoise like to swim right on the bow, uh, right on the nose of fin whales, humpbacks, resident killer whales. They, they do it all the time. We'll see them, not all the time, but we'll see them frequently swimming just like they would have on your boat. And why they do it, they must have fun doing it, but sometimes we think humpbacks get, get irritated. We see some wheezing and slapping and wonder if it's just like mosquitoes buzzing around the face or something. But they will, they'll, yeah off of residents and even though the trans they must know the terms. Uh, yeah. Do you know approximately how many killer whales there are worldwide? Boy, worldwide I have a hard time answering that. I I don't know, 30,000, 50,000. I can speak to Alaska a little better. In our catalog we have about 700 residents cataloged and we have about 100 transients. So that just spans from southeast Alaska to about Kodiak. But not including all that are in Kodiak, not including all that are in Southeast, but ones that have been seen in those areas. I've heard reports of a few thousand residents out in the Aleutians in Western Alaska. So if you look at the whole Pacific, I would, the North Pacific, I would bet 10, 15,000, something like that. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But generally, about 80% in the North Pacific are residents, a very small percentage are transients and very, even smaller percentage offshores. And then in other parts of the world it varies. In Antarctica we have a really hard time surveying or knowing how many there are. In other, but pretty slim in the tropics and very abundant in the polar or temperate regions. Yeah? Do you have any thoughts as to why some of these pods aren't recovering? Um, and what the mechanisms might be for that? Is it lack of fertility after the spill? Or? Yeah, that's hard to know. That The 18 ones might have been in a genetic bottleneck already with only 22 animals with that haplotype and we don't know if they were breeding with the other Gulf of Alaska transients or not. We don't, we don't know that. 
and um, and so it it is hard to know that exposure to oil and respirating oil can 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 certainly cause some reproductive issues, uh, but also the harbor seal population declined pretty massively as a result of oil spill as well, and and well and, and other things, and so that was one of their main prey items, and so. When any animal is food stressed, then they stop producing offspring. So it's 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 hard to pinpoint. There there could have been factors other than the oil spill effect in the 18 months, and then harbor seal reduction and exposure toxins. All of that could possibly be. And there's really no way to get at that. As far as the residents, um, it's it, you know it'd be surprising if the oil didn't affect them in some way because they're not they're not on the same trajectory with population growth that the, that the others are. But part of that could be they lost a, quite a few mothers. So sometimes population dynamics gets tricky because if you have a lot of mothers in one group, they're going to they're gonna explode if those mothers are being productive because some of our mothers are having like six or seven calves and other ones only a few. So if you lose a lot of mothers in the population and in that AB pod you did during the oil spill uh, or after the oil spill, then, then they could have a slower growth just because there's a lower portion of females, potentially. And females typically don't dump toxins. Uh, well, let's see. No, I'm sorry. That's the other way around. Males don't dump toxins. Females can dump them out of their, out of their, their calf often. Yeah? My daughter had a question. Yeah? Um, is there any way that killer whales attack polar bears? Well, I don't think that's been observed. There are some killer whales that go to the Arctic. Uh, killer whales have been observed eating narwhals and seals, of course. I haven't heard of any with eating a polar bear, but it's, it's certainly possible. You know, there is one documented case in Prince William Sound of a killer whale eating a moose that was swimming from <laughs> island island. So, so in, in, in biology, you hate, to ne you hate to never say never because crazy things happen. So from that standpoint, I'd say maybe, maybe sure, probably, why not, maybe it's happened. Um, I, I doubt they do it to uh, who knows. Yes, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, not the moose, but can the other prey mammals tell the difference between the different species? I mean, do the seals see the residents in panic, or do they? Are they you know, they yeah. sure seem to know the difference. I've I've seen residents swim by sea lion haulouts and had the sea lions not get affected. I've seen seal haulouts the same. I've seen seals in the water when training. They they somehow. No, I've seen transients swim by and had sea lions jumping out of the water. It, and then, of course, with dolls porpoise, they absolutely know. And how they know, I don't, I don't know. It, it, it could have a lot to do with the acoustics because transients are very quiet and residents are very vocal. And there's one interesting story that Craig Neva told me in Thumb Cove in Resurrection Bay where they were with some transients. All of a sudden, the transients sucked into the shoreline and started spending long downtimes. And they were wondering why. Just this massive change of behavior. They'd been out in the middle and they sucked into the shoreline. And then some residents passed by. And then after they'd gone by, the transients came back out and resumed what they were doing before. So I don't think they like being around the noisy environment. You know, they like to they like to hunt and stealth, and the residents probably screwed that up. So I imagine a lot of animals hear the residents coming from a long, long ways away and know there's residents around. Hear the clicking is just it's uh it's a world we don't relate to quite as much, but I'm sure they're very aware before they even see them. And transients don't tend to associate with residents. So like, I, it's very rare that I've seen them in the same general region. They don't associate. I think the transients avoid them a lot. And I bet the animals know that if, if there's residents around, that there probably aren't going to be transients around, is, is my guess. There have been incidences of residents bullying up on transients. And whether that's because there's rare but occasional instances of transients trying to take calves of residents, or whether it's just a, who knows what it, what it is, but there's there's some heavy avoidance. We don't we don't have a lot of information on why. Do you, do you know if anyone's studying the uh, shark eaters in the Bering Sea and whether whether there's any predation on uh, belugas? Um, there's n there's not a huge effort in the Bering Sea on killer whales in general. NOAA tries to do some of their big ship time, but of course. Big NOAA ship time is extremely expensive, and since killer whales aren't endangered, aside from the AT1s and the southern residents of Washington, 
Um, there's not a lot of money for killer whale research. So in terms of uh, predation on belugas, there's, there's certainly probably some, although that Although the silty water, I think belugas outperform killer whales in, in some of the areas, and that's probably why they're found in some of those silty and ice ridden and colder waters, probably. But um, yeah, there's not, and offshores are very difficult to study because they're so on the move and far offshore often, and we just don't know much about offshores at all. There's not as many of them, so we don't run across them as often. They're just a lot. I've heard stories of occasional killer whale predation in the Naknak River mm -hmm. and probably up in the Nishigak during smolt up migration. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wondered if uh, that is transient resident, what? what uh, I, there were some transients that were stranded actually up in the Nishigak a few years ago um, that, that stranded and died. Or they, they got in the freshwater for so long that physiologically it just started running them down. I think they got ill because of it, probably. But they, they ended up dying and stranding up in there. And those, yeah, those could have been transients going for either beluga or for seals. Uh, it's quite likely as well in some of those areas, seals that are, that are fishing. Yeah, Nick, did you? Or? Oh, what's the uh, average age of a killer whale? And is there any documented attacks of humans? Uh, no, it's a, no documented attacks of humans in the wild. Um, and I meant to talk about the average age. It's really interesting. Females live often 60 to 80 years, and males only 40 to 50 years. And uh, people often wonder why there's such a difference, but females have to take care of their young, and males tend to do stupid and reckless things. That's my guess. No, they, actually, there's kind of anecdotally a lot of people saying that males don't have a lot to live for after their mom dies. And due to, due to the nature of their social structure, we do see some males pass on not long after their mother. It's fairly common to see that. And it's, it's really interesting. But I do want to... Um, the other question about captivity, there is an interesting thing where in the wild, one time a scuba diver in BC was trying to hang on to a wild killer whale store something and put up with it for a while, and then it grabbed her in its mouth, swam down 50 feet, turned three circles, and let her go. <laughs> and she was not bleeding. Her wetsuit was cut a bit, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> Are they ever aggressive with each other between the pods? Is there any you know, we don't observe it. We don't observe that. We don't really know. But there's so much that happens below the water that we don't see. Obviously, they have scars and rake marks, and we don't know if that's play fighting. We don't know if that's aggression. We don't see, like, outright ramming, which would be a very effective way if they were to ter territorial or, or being aggressive. So everyone who's worked with kill for a long, long time thinks that there's not aggression, but there could be, and we don't see it. I, I often wonder about that, but we haven't seen anything that... So they're just pretty social. They just kind of meet up, swim together a while, and then... And then head on their way. Mm -hmm. And it's probably through those acoustic cues moms calling to, like... <coughs> yeah. But I have seen the AKs that I mentioned. I've seen them swimming, and on all of a sudden, the male just... The male and his younger sibling just shot out towards the Chiswell Islands. And, and I was like, oh, this would be interesting, because mom was still going up a different channel. So they were right at Harbor Island, so they had to split. And he, he just took off. He was like, see, mom. And so I was like, there must be some other whales out there. So we went out there and we saw we saw mom and the rest kind of go and follow where her son was going. And then we, we got out there and there was a pod from southeast out there. And so I'm sure there's those moments where mom has a hard time keeping the boys on the farm. And um, yeah. Any other? Yeah. For how close do you have to be with that hydrophone to get those kind of recordings? Well, if you have a quiet listening environment without... You know, without big ships, or and actually some small, tiny boats and jet skis are very, very loud. If they're, depends where the exhaust, if the exhaust is underwater and outboard can be very loud. But if you have a quiet listening environment, um, we think we can hear them 12, 15 miles sometimes. If uh, good crystal clear calls, they're often, you know, 100, 100 yards or 50 to 200 yards or something like that. But you can actually hear them. One time I was in my kayak at Fox and I heard about 8 miles away just on a $200 hydrophone and headphones. And uh, I think I was eight miles away from where they were, and I can still hear who it was and tell, be able to tell who it was. Uh, is, that, yeah. is there any excellence of uh, sailing gear and the uh, loads? Same gear? Same gear, uh, fishing gear. 
Um, I don't, Craft you know, maybe other people in this room can answer this better than I can. I, I haven't heard stories of killer, killer whales getting tangled in gear. I, down in California or something, there was a buoy, like a crab trap or something, line wrapped around the tail stock that, that one washed up with. But anyone else heard of same gear? I, I haven't heard of for killer whales. Um, I've heard of humpbacks swimming through same nets. They're, they yeah, beat seen as a gill nest. I'm sure they know it's there. But. You know, they don't. Yeah, and the the echolocation has got to come in real handy for that because it's so precise for killer whales and belugas and sperm whales and all those that any any toothed whale should be very aware of of gear in the water, I would think. But in terms of awareness, you never know. Like, I mean, when I'm driving a tour boat and I see a humpback. You know, people often like, are they aware of us that we're here? And it's like, well, if it's a juvenile breaching 20 times in a row, no, I don't think so. I'm not going to get in his way, you know. But if, if it's a if it's an adult who's experienced and kind of awake, and you know, and it's, it's much, so it's always the behavior state. I think has a lot to do with, you know, if they're chasing a fish or if it, versus if they're just swimming slowly and checking things out versus if they're resting. Or I think all those behavior states will have a big impact on how aware they are. But I, I don't recall too many gear interactions with kill whales. But I have seen photos of kill whale with a uh, crab line, crab trap, um, line around its tail stock. But not, not so big a problem, is it? They tend not to be in the shallower waters, too, except the transients do, but the residents tend to be out in the channels a bit more. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Right. Sorry. Yeah.